Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Will Rogers. And he says, uh, even if you're on the right track, you're going to get run over if you ain't going nowhere. And uh, I think he's right. And what I'm going to talk about today is pursuing excellence. And, you know, I think excellence is not as much a destination as it is a never-ending pursuit to get there. And for those of you who've had those mountaintop experiences, they're, they're very few and far between and very short-lived. And they're cool when you experience them, but the next morning, what are you doing? You're right back up trying to do it again. And so this whole idea of pursuing excellence, the reason I say pursuing excellent rather than how to be excellent, is I don't think you ever arrive. I don't think you ever just exhale and say, wow, I'm excellent. No, you're <laughs> you continue to pursue, you continue to drive, and you know, I kind of want to just share what I've learned in my football experiences. Uh, a lot of the examples I'm going to be using are in my line of work, but I think having grown up in a real estate family and, and understanding some of what goes on in you guys' life, you may be able to relate and uh, take something with you. Uh, I want to give you a little background into how football works. A lot of this uh, may surprise you, but just so that you might be able to understand a little bit better where I'm coming from, uh, there are very few superstars in the NFL. I know the commercials make it look like it's this glamorous deal and private jets all over the place and can't go eat at a Chili's because you'll be bombarded by everyone wanting your eye. I mean, for the Peyton Mannings and Tom Brady's and guys like that, okay, that's probably accurate. But for the rest of us, we're not superstars. And uh, the average NFL career, anyone guess how long the average NFL career is? Two years. Three years. Three years. Three years. That's why you become vested for retirement benefits at four years. <laughs> so we're coming up on the NFL draft, I believe it's in a couple of weeks, and there'll be all this hype and all this excitement. Everyone's just so enthralled into what's going to happen. And, and the sad reality is most of these guys, even the first round picks, very few of them are going to make it longer than a couple of years in the NFL. Uh, an NFL contract is not really a contract. What I mean by that, you may read, you may see the little ticker on ESPN that says so and so signed a six year deal worth whatever. Well in baseball, it is a contract. So he's gonna he's gonna get paid that money whether he can pitch a ball or not. In basketball, that is a contract. If he forgets how to make a layup, he's still gonna get paid. In my line of work, you get paid as long as you're employed. They can cut you at any point and not pay you another dollar. So there is a, an unspoken stress or intensity that goes along in the NFL that's unique to other professional sports. If you're ever uh, reading about the selfish, uh, egotistical professional football player who demands all that bonus money, and you think he's a turd ball for doing that, <laughs> that's why he wants the bonus, because that's the only true money he can count on and put in the bank. Because from that moment on, you get paid a game check. For every game you play, you get a paycheck the next day. And so what winds up happening is you have a lot of guys who live week to week. I know the first five, six years of my career, it was literally, I hope I have a job next week. And you know, if I miss a kick during a game, you know, those plane ride home could be kind of tough. Wondering, what's tomorrow going to hold? What am I going to do? Can I get another job? I may not have any money coming in. Uh, the the long-term uh, stay places like Hyatt Homes and Marriott Courtyards, a lot of guys live in those. It's not the mansions with the private security guards and the cool-looking dogs that'll get you if you, you know, any stray person comes along. I mean, it's a, it's a very uncertain, uh, stressful, uh, existence. Uh, I have one of 32 jobs like it in the world. There's no backup at my position. If you play offensive tackle, there'll be a backup. On, a, on any team, there'll be two or three quarterbacks. There's one kicker. So you hit a dry patch, guess what? They're on to the next guy. So one of 32 jobs like it in the world, and it's highly competitive, obviously. You guys watch college football. 
uh, every Saturday there's games on from sun up to sundown. Well, that's the next crop of guys coming in every year to take my job. And they're looking younger and better. <laughs> I'm glad I got in when I did. These young guys are, are amazing. Uh, and, and you know, now, I don't know if you can relate to this, but now that I am older, I'm going in my 17th season coming up, uh, not only do I need to be better than those young guys, I need to be better by a significant margin because they're a whole lot cheaper. And just like any business, our owner wants to make a living. And if he can pay one kicker this and get a similar, maybe a little bit less, but a close to similar performance instead of paying an old guy this, guess who he's going to pick? So there's a lot of uh, unknowns that, that people don't quite think about. And that's why when I hear to this day someone say, why do you work so hard? Why do you continue to grind and push yourself? You're too old for that. In my line of work, I am old. But I tell them because I have to. There's no easing up. There's no day where you wake up and go, what? I'm excellent. No, I'm pursuing excellence. And so you'd be surprised, I know I have been, that in, my, in this environment that I just described to you, uh, you'd be surprised how few guys truly pursue excellence. A lot of guys are just there to be just good enough, uh, to just hang on, to maybe live it up for a few years. Uh, they don't truly desire to be excellent. Uh, you may hear the, the common excuses would be, oh, I blew up my knee. Y'all heard that, you know, yeah. you're, you're at the bar, or you're at the, the meeting, and someone, yeah, I would have been great, but, you know, I blew my knee out. Well, I blew my knee out my senior year of high school. Uh, oh, the politics, you know, the co the new coach came in, and he didn't, he didn't like me, or the new boss came to town, and he wanted to clean house. I, I would have had a great career, but the new boss, well, I've had seven head coaches. So, those excuses, I mean, hey, they may have some truth to them, but I think they represent the population that doesn't truly desire to pursue excellence. I want to give you some numbers for you numbers of people out here. Uh, this is from an Adam Schefter tweet, you know, the ESPN insider guy. He's not always right, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to use his numbers uh, for my purposes here. Uh, every year, in high school, uh, there are 310,465 football playing seniors. 310,465. Of that 310,000, 20,000 make it to college football. Uh, so that's 6.5% of high school playing seniors make it to college. Uh, you keep going. Uh, by their senior year, there's 15,588. That's 15,588 uh, football playing seniors in college. Guess how many uh, make it to the NFL out of that 15,000? 700. That's close. 300. Oh, wow. That's 1.6% of football playing seniors in college make it to the NFL. And then even more amazing to me, and I referenced this earlier, was that only half of that 1.6%, so according to my math, that's 0.8%, only half of those make it to year four in the NFL. So you start out with 310,000, you go down to 20,000, you go down to 15,000, you go down to 300, and then only 150 of those make it to year four of their career. I think what those numbers suggest to me and there's, there's always exceptions to this. Uh, but become, pursuing excellence is difficult. The longer you pursue it, the longer you chase it, the longer you strive after it, you're going to kind of look around and be like, there's not as many people doing it uh, as used to. It's tough. Uh, a lot of people want to play football in the NFL, but by the time you get to it, it just it's smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, so what I'd like to do with all that in mind is share with you, suggest to you five principles that I've learned uh, given this environment and my work experience and, and uh, hopefully it's something that you can, something I say you can take with you and, 
and apply to what it is you guys do. And, and by the way, I have tremendous respect for what y'all do. Uh, I remember being the little kid when mom used to sell, you know, pushing the open house signs in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> Having to set up the lemonade that no one would drink. <laughs> I get it. And then the, how about the client that always wants to look at homes but never buys? Y'all got any of those? Oh, forget a few of those. All right, so five principles to pursuing excellence. The first one is fundamentals are essential. Um, fundamentals aren't the most glamorous thing to uh, focus on. Uh, they're not always going to give you the most immediate results. Uh, but fundamentals are something you never graduate from needing. Uh, they will remain central to any success you have. Uh, I like to think of it, of it like this, you know, with all the te technological advances and, and all the stuff that buildings now have, think about these homes, how they build homes differently now than 30 years ago, or these skyscrapers that are just amazing to look at and all the cool stuff. No matter how far down the road we get with building these cool buildings that look awesome, they all have to have a foundation. They all do. We're seeing it out in Allen right now, the football stadium, the $60 million football stadium. <laughs> Looks awesome. Guess what? We got problems. We got problems. Uh, so, in my line of work, uh, there's about a, it's like a golf swing. There's about a million things to kick in a ball that need to go right to execute the kick. Well, for me, I've, I've boiled it down to my first step. When I'm standing back there, and my first step is only about this long, and it needs to be online. So online and that long. If I can make that first step correctly, good results will follow. And so I've been kicking a ball for a long time in a lot of different places at a lot of different levels. And to this day, it all comes back to that first step. Uh, we were playing this past season in Arizona. Uh, it's a dome, perfect feel, perfect kicking conditions. Everything's as I would want it. I'd made 27 field goals in a row, feeling great, had a great pregame warm-up. Everything is just, you know, momentum is at my side. And I go out and try a 24-yard field goal that I literally could sit in this chair, swing my leg, and make a 24-yard field goal. And I miss. 27 in a row, perfect environment, Momentum at my back, everything going great, and guess what I messed up? First, first, step. first step. It's the worst feeling on earth. I felt the step go long and a little outside, and I said, oh no. And that's before I ever got to the ball. And you would like to think a guy that's been kicking for almost 30 years can kind of figure out how to make a 24-yard field goal. It was just a reminder to me that no matter how far I've come, no matter how much success I've had, it still goes back to the fundamentals. So that's the first thing I've learned about pursuing excellence, is that fundamentals are essential. Uh, the second one is that, and this is a big one, uh, comparisons are a mirage. Uh, we've all seen that scene in a movie where somebody's dying of thirst in the desert and they think they see the oasis and you know the heat waves are going up and they strive and, and, and they sacrifice everything to get there only to find out it was, it was only a mirage. Well, uh, that's kind of how comparisons are. And what I mean by that is uh, the problem with comparisons is you are always going to see the best in others and the worst in yourself. If you come up and you're looking around, uh, you're going to see what they do really well and you're only going to see where you fall short. That's discouraging. Uh, it, it burdens you. It slows you down. Uh, and as, as we saw with those stats I gave you from Adam Schefter, if you're comparing yourself to what everyone else is doing, chances are you're comparing yourself to a direction you don't want to go. Most people don't pursue excellence. So why should we start looking at what everyone else is doing and allow that to infiltrate our minds and tell us the path you know, we should be taking? Uh, I know that when I start comparing myself to other guys, the assessments or the the uh, decisions I start making about myself are incorrect. 
because I'm so busy looking at them and I once again I'm seeing what they do really well I don't see their bad days I don't see their failures I don't see their struggles I only see what they do good I walk away feeling like a complete failure and that's not an, that's not an accurate assessment uh, a good a good way to put this would be if we allow our peers to set the bar chances are we're setting the bar too low because most people are not doing it right. Most people are not pursuing excellence. I see it in my line of work all the time. Uh, most guys cut themselves. They cut themselves. Uh, they're not professional. They don't take it serious enough. They're not committed enough. And it's real fashionable at cut time to come up with those excuses I listed earlier. Oh, I got hurt. Oh, the coach is a jerk. You know, those are all convenient. But it's my experience just watching most guys cut themselves. That's why they don't make the team. And I think it applies to a much broader sense. There are very few of us pursuing excellence. And one of the reasons is we get caught up in making comparisons. Always trying to see what the other guy is doing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. Y'all feel like you're in church? Yeah. <laughs> I set a beer here to let everyone relax. <laughs> All right, number three. Uh, this is a hard one. I wish this wasn't true, and I've worked very hard to avoid it, but there isn't any avoiding it. Uh, when you pursue excellence, you need to understand that there will be setbacks. Not if, when. So the, all the time and all the effort uh, exhausted trying to avoid a setback, I think it's wasted. There's going to be setbacks. Uh, in 1998, I left the University of Texas and felt like I'd had a fairly decent career there and had a chance to go play in the NFL. And all the all the agents and all the so-called experts who were plugged into the NFL environment were telling me, "You're going to get drafted pretty high. Congratulations!" Yada 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 yada. So we draft day rolls around and we throw a big draft day party. You've probably seen it on TV. And we ran out backcountry barbecue over close to where I grew up and uh, wait for the phone to ring. And I don't know, those of you familiar with the draft, there's a long list on the screen that says Mel Kuyper's best available. Well, about the middle of the second round, my name started appearing on that list. And the longer the draft went on, the higher and higher and higher my name got. And before you know it, my name is the number one best of available player. Well, for the rest of that day, and all of day two, all seven rounds of the NFL draft, the phone never rang. And that was the start to my NFL career. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Enjoy <laughs> <laughs> your barbecue. Now I'm going to go jump off the bridge. <laughs> this is how things were going. And uh, my career began with a setback. Uh, one of the neat things about my job is we get these cool guest speakers to come in. And we had a guy one year, and, and it really stuck with me. His name is Teddy Atlas. He's the ESPN boxing guy. He, he kind of has a little bit of a list, but he, he trained guys all the way from Muhammad Ali to Mike Tyson. I mean, he spent decades in corners of boxing rings. And he said something that just blew me away. He said that in his experience dealing with fighters, very few of them ever get knocked out. And everyone in the room like, what do you mean? We see these guys, you know, laying flat on their back and the refs counting to 10. He goes, it's been his experience that most guys make a silent agreement in their mind when to lay down. Whether it's a slight drop of the gloves to allow that uppercut to hit them, or they start thinking of a good excuse, why they lost, kind of the loser's limp mentality. He said the, the, the truly, truly great ones are the ones who never decide to lay down. And that just, that just blew me away. So if we're saying that setbacks are a part of the deal, if we're going to truly pursue excellence, we're not going to lay down. It doesn't matter how hard it gets, how hard it hurts, to be truly excellent, we're not going to choose to lay down. It's not how to avoid the setback, it's how to respond, how to remain determined, 
and in the absence of reward, are we going to remain committed? You know, I spent 14 years in Cleveland and played in one playoff game. I can't tell you how many nights when my back hurt and my hips hurt and everything hurt and I was just frustrated. My team was losing and, you know, I'm seeing my peers who I know I can perform with. They're making it to the Pro Bowl and they're getting all these accolades and they're getting the big contracts and comparisons, right? All that's going on in my mind. And finally in year 14, it all clicked. I was able to make my Pro Bowl. My point is there's a lot of opportunities between when you when the setback occurs and when the reward comes. And you have to remain determined, remain focused, remain committed, and just keep grinding away. We have a, we have a slogan in football, chin down, elbows up. We're not going to look around, we're not going to whine, we're, we're just going to go to work. We're just going to go to work. So there will be setbacks. Fourth uh, principle is this. Uh, your journey towards excellence will be your own. Uh, this kind of piggybacks off the comparison thing. Your, your path is going to be different than one of your, your uh, peers. Uh, the reason for that is each and every one of us has been given abilities and, and talents. And so your flavor may be a little different uh, than someone else's. So uh, obviously listening to wise counsel is critical. But at the end of the day, you take that counsel, you take that teaching, and then you fit it to your deal. Uh, in football, there's three kinds of guys that I've narrowed it down to. Uh, and these are all guys trying to be excellent. Uh, there's grinders. And these are the guys that maybe things don't come quite as easy, but I'm telling you what, no one's gonna outwork them, no one's gonna treat it more important than them, and they're gonna work their tails off to get the job done. They just grind away. And that's, I kinda, that's kinda my style. I like getting down and getting after it. And uh, that's one kind. Then there's the gifted guys. Obviously, everyone in the NFL is gifted, but I'm talking to these guys that are off the charts. Uh, they make everything look easy. Uh, you know, I'm in the weight room working out, and they come walking in with their McDonald's bag, and they've got muscles. <laughs> you know, they're gifted, all right? I mean, they, they, uh, funny story, we had uh, off-season workouts last year, and we had a plyometric box about this high and we're supposed to jump up on this box. And I'm kind of looking at it. <laughs> I can't do this. And then the coach says, not only are you going to jump on that, you're going to start out in a push-up position, spring up to your feet, and immediately jump. And so now I'm, 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 I'm hosed. I can't do it. <laughs> and if that's not bad enough, I'm right behind one of our outside linebackers who's about 260 pounds. You wouldn't think he can jump like this. And not only does he pop up, not only does he jump, but he jumps over the box. Oh. And now Phil's next. You know? <laughs> In your line of work, it may be the people that are just, that just have the magnetic personalities, and they go they go to eat dinner, and they meet six people who want to now buy a house from them because they just have that kind of that kind of thing going on around them. So there's grinders, there's gifted, and then do you know what the Hall of Famers are? They're both. The Hall of Famers in my line of work are the gifted ones who are grinders on top of it. And uh, when I first started kicking. And kicking kind of chose me. I didn't want to be a kicker. Not many little boys do. Uh, mine certainly don't. But I remember us, mom and dad, and I came home from my first camp, and the guy who put the camp on said, you know, hey, this might need to be something your son pursues. And I remember dad pulling me off to the side. He goes, you've been given a gift. Uh, now go be a talented overachiever. And that always stuck with me because up to that point, and in some ways it's still around, when we hear the word overachiever, we think of the person who's not very talented or not very good at what they do, but they have a big heart and they just work super hard and they overcome. The truly great ones are the ones who have a little something to work with, but they work like they're an overachiever. So be a talented overachiever. So uh, my whole career, Given the position I play, I've been told, Phil, you work.
work out too much, you work too hard, you take it way too serious, uh, you're way too focused. Those have been comments throughout my career. And coming back to this thought of your journey will be yours. Well, that's kind of my personality. I'm kind of a principal, just kind of a serious guy. When it's time to go to work, you know, there you go. Do I wish I could be the fun guy over in the corner? Sure, that'd be, that'd be great. But for me to do my deal, that's how I gotta be. And 17 years later, I'm still going. So your journey's gonna be yours. Figure out what it is you do well, how you've been gifted, or what your talents are. Take wise counsel, but then follow your path. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then the last one. Uh, this whole pursuit of excellence occurs one step at a time. Uh, like I said at the very beginning, it's not necessarily a destination. It's not like you just get there and say, oh, I'm, I'm excellent now. Uh, it's a pursuit. It's a, it's a, there's a sense of ongoingness to it. Uh, you know, when I started out in Cleveland in 99, uh, I was undrafted like I told you guys, and my career was off to a rocky start, and had to compete with two other kickers in training camp, and it came final cut day, and this is where we were going to find out who made the team. And all I wanted to hear was, you're our guy. I didn't get to hear it on draft day. My name was never called. I had to go spend an entire season in New England on their practice squad where I never got to play. So fast forward, here I am in 1999, still longing for that moment where, hey, Phil, you're our guy. And so final cuts come. I see the other two kickers walking out with their bags. I'm thinking, Here's my moment. Here's what I've been waiting for. Here's what I've been dreaming about. Uh, Chris Palmer, our head coach, comes walking down the hallway, and I'm getting excited with every step. Here it comes. And he goes, Dawson, we're going to start out with you. <laughs> so my career started with not being drafted, and then I had that bomb lowered on me. Remember, our, our contracts aren't guaranteed. So I was on a week-to-week -week deal, and that's basically what he was saying is, you miss a kick, you're gone. And that was my start to my career. I somehow, through the years, one step at a time, made it 14 years there. At that point, if you would have asked me, you're going to be here longer than anyone in, uh, in Brown's history, I would have said, you're nuts. But rather than going big picture, rather than focusing on that, chin down, elbows up. What am I going to do right now to keep my job? And that really has been my mentality, even now that I'm kind of on the other side of it, and people are like, oh yeah, take it easy, you've, you've proven yourself. You know what you're doing. No. Ooh. One step at a time. I'm one bad game away uh, from this thing all coming to an end. And something interesting happened, you know, those 14 years in Cleveland of very little success as a team, I wondered quietly, have I just grown com you know, comfortable being good on a bad team? Or could I truly do what I'm doing here, but on a big stage, when it really mattered, when, it, when the whole world's watching? You know, how many of you see Cleveland Browns games on a Sunday? Not many of you. <laughs> how many of you see San Francisco games? That's a pretty big difference. So I, I had quietly wondered, you know, if given the opportunity, uh, if my market ever changes, can I step up with the big boys? And so I get this opportunity to become a 49er this past season. And I remember walking into the building, and right off the bat, you stare at five Lombardi trophies. It's like, hello, welcome to big time. And so this almost this sense of, of uh, excitement and fear all at the same time <laughs> mesh. And I said, well, I'm going to get the chance to find out. Surely it's going to feel a whole lot different. Surely it's going to sound a whole lot different. I'm not, surely I'm not prepared for this because I've, I haven't played on the big stage. Well, I'm here to tell you, looking back on last season, it was really weird. It didn't feel a whole lot different. It didn't sound a whole lot different. I didn't feel much more stressed than I normally did. I was so used to just taking things one step at a time, I didn't get caught up in the bigger stage or the how many extra people were paying attention or the ramifications of an individual kick. Even in the playoffs, we're playing in the NFC Championship game at Seattle, winner goes to the Super Bowl, 
in the entire fourth quarter, we're down three points. And there were moments, you know, I, I go get a sip of Gatorade, and I'm doing this. <laughs> I'm starting to go big picture. I'm starting to think about all that stuff. And so my response was, no, go back to my routine. So I went right back over to my net, and I started kicking balls in the net, working on my first step. That's how I handled that. And it's amazing how this one step at a time mentality, while you're pursuing true excellence, you do have a goal, you do have long range vision, but your daily approach to getting there is one step at a time. And there is a, I'm not gonna preach to you guys, but there's a story out of the Bible that I think exemplifies this perfectly. And you know, you've, you've all heard God will take care of you and show you how to go and all that kind of stuff. Well, uh, there's a verse that says he'll be a light unto your feet. I never really truly knew what that meant. Well, back in that culture, they, instead of flashlights, obviously, didn't have them, they put these little lanterns on their sandals. And the lanterns themselves would illuminate enough for them to see their next step. It wasn't the whole road. It was just enough for the next step. And I think that paints a beautiful picture. Even though we're on a long journey, even though it's never ending, like we said at the beginning, to be truly excellent, if we just pay attention to the next step, one step at a time, how am I going to do my job today, rather than how am I going to be the greatest ever, it's amazing what happens when your uh, situations start to increase and the, maybe the size of homes you start moving starts increases and the kind of people you start working with starts changing. It won't feel all that different. It won't be near as intimidating. You'll just be doing your deal. And remember, your journey's here. So it just kind of fits. So uh, as you pursue excellence, just remember it's one step at a time. So fundamentals are essential. Comparisons are a mirage. There will be setbacks, unfortunately. Your journey will be yours, and we pursue this whole thing one step at a time. So that's all I've learned in 17 years. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much what I got.